My name is David Hernandez, and you're listening to As the Pokeball Turns. Welcome to As the Pokeball Turns, where we interview people around the community on how their Pokemon Go journey started, where it has been, and where it is currently going. When it comes to Pokemon Go PvP, one can easily start battling by a simple push of the button. However, to win by understanding metas, creating teams, and learning move counts is an entirely different matter and has a steep learning curve. Thankfully, there are some within the community who have taken the call to action and develop ways to educate the player base and help improve their skills in PvP. Places like BTW Podcast, PvP Corner, and we can't forget PV Poke are invaluable to both the growth and longevity of PvP. Another resource is a group known as Palatown PvP, whose slogan is, This is where the journey of many future champions begin. Their three pillars of education, entertainment, and growth drive their mission statement every day. With education, they hope to improve everyone's collective skills. With entertainment, they make engaging content centered around PvP. And with growth, they focus on getting more people into PvP and getting them excited about what can be done with it outside of GBL. And my guest is more than eager to tell us more about this community. He is the mayor of Pallet Town PvP and one half of the PvP corner at the GoCast podcast. From Adelaide, Australia, here is his origin story into the world of Pokemon Go. This is Fish on a Heater. Today, I'm joined by the mayor of Pallet Town PvP and the co-host of the PvP corner on GoCast, Fish on a Heater. Fish, welcome to the show. Hey, man. I'm really excited to be here. Me too. Now, I gotta ask you real quick about your name. At first, when I first heard it, I thought, like, this guy's just struggling to have an oven, so he makes fish on a heater to be able to cook lunch. But actually, it's a poker term, right? It's a poker term, yeah. So before I got on my Pokemon Go PvP journey, I was just starting out studying the game of poker. Because like a lot of things in life, there's just a lot more to it than what the untrained eye would know. So it is actually possible to learn all the mathematics behind the game of poker to a point where you are able to do it professionally. And so I was very new on that journey, hadn't gone real deep into it, but I was already starting to make a little bit of profit on it. Then Pokemon Go PvP kind of caught my eye and it was like I was in a relationship (laughs) and then the new girl came along is it like that you just saw pokemon go and then you just see the guy turning back and saying (laughs) yeah exactly that meme without a doubt now obviously we know you are the mayor and you're part of the go cast podcast is the pvp corner but everybody has an origin story everybody has a start point so i gotta ask the question when did you first start playing pokemon go well i was a day oneer I had seen talks from Niantic representatives before the game had come out talking about, oh, there's this thing we're working on, like seen promos for it, and I was super excited about it. Then, of course, on day one, my friend messages me to say, it's out. By then, it wasn't even that high up in the Google Play rankings at that stage. I had to actually like scroll through a bit to find Pokemon Go. It was that new. But, you know, as soon as it was out, I downloaded it, played it for quite a while. Then, like many, many people, I did get bored of it eventually, fell off the wagon. About a year and a half later, that same friend who was always playing that whole time said to me, you should pick this game back up again. There's a lot more in it now than when you left. I picked it back up and there were things like raids. There were so many more Pokemon in the game. There were so many more features that weren't in the game at the time. So I did rekindle a bit of an interest. That would have died out again if PvP hadn't become a thing. So once PvP happened, that's when the love affair started. (laughs) (laughs) That's fair. So when you first left the game, do you remember when you left? Was it after Gen 2 came out or was it a little bit later? when post that, yeah. I don't remember exactly when it was. I know Gen 2 definitely was in-game. 
I think it was after they introduced daily catch and Pokestop streaks. Yeah, so that was around the midway point with Gen 2 right before raids came. So you left right before raids started, it sounds right. like. Very poor timing. <laughs> And it worked out because you eventually came back to the game. Yeah, and eventually caught up on all the things that I missed. When I did come back, it was during, I want to say, second run of Mewtwo raids. And so I was there trying to solo Mewtwo's, like not understanding that you've got to team up with oh yeah, this like level 25 guy trying to solo a Mewtwo. Hey, at least you tried, man. At least you tried. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> so going back to first day, right? What was it like in the area that you were at when Pokemon Go was released? Where did you go to play? So I live in a city called Adelaide. It's a good sized city. So we've got like one and a half million people, but it feels like a country town. There's only three or four places you can go around the city that are densely populated enough to really make grinding worthwhile. Otherwise, you know, if you're not part of those particular communities, then it's pretty hard to play anything other than just solo play. So it's not like a downtown area, but it's more like here in America, we'd probably call it maybe suburbs or town outside of downtown. Is that kind of the best way to describe it? Yeah, there is town. That's one of the places. That's probably the easiest place for me to play. But then there's a couple of other like suburban areas. There's one area called Glenelg, which is a beachside location, which is a beautiful, beautiful place. I like, encourage you to look it up. It's like one of the most beautiful places you'll see on Google. And then Mawson Lakes is another one that there's a, a reasonably healthy community at. Before Pokemon Go came out, did you have any experience with Pokemon at all? Yes. The first two generations on the Game Boy games. I had played Yellow version. My mum got it for me for Christmas after I saw all my friends playing it. In the first generation of games, the doors were represented by just that little rectangle. So I didn't know that that was a door. So I spent the first couple of hours of my Pokemon experience trying to work out how to get out of my house. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah, because it was <laughs> just an outline, I think. It was just like a rug almost. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so eventually I, I just accidentally pressed the right button that allowed me to get out of the house. I'm like, oh, and then my Pokemon journey began. It's just like you feel so dumb in the moment. Yeah. But also like relief that done now, you don't have to worry about it anymore. So you come to Pokemon Go. You've only played the first two generations. You never played any of the other ones, right? No. So when you come back to Pokemon Go, how did you like catch up with all the Pokemon? Did you just kind of learn it from experience or did you like go online to find out the new Pokemon? I'm talking like Gen 3, Gen 4 and all that yeah. that had been already released. I started playing Gens 3, 4 and 5 on emulators after I picked Pokemon Go back up. So I was kind of doing that at the same time. So I learned it all together, basically. The world of Pokemon Go and the world of the main series games that all just experienced it all at once. Seeing something in Pokemon Go and then seeing it in the main series game, I'm like, okay, now I understand what that Pokemon is. Do you have a particular favorite Pokemon at all? So I, I have been telling people Umbreon. I'll probably stick with that. I'm really liking Dratini at the moment as well. Umbreon and Dratini are Pokemon that are really, really cute, but also very badass. And I'm talking about mainly in the Pokemon Go PvP sense, like Dragonite and Umbreon are both incredibly good for PvP. So I love how they both combine their bad acidness <laughs> with extreme cuteness. So you mentioned how PvP is what really got you re-engaged with the game. Mm -hmm. What was it about PvP that really motivates you to play Pokemon Go more? I've always appreciated the thing about PvP that it makes a lot more of the Pokemon Go world exciting. So, for example, one particular memory that stands out is when they first introduced Spotlight Hours, and the first one was like Onyx. I was the only person I knew that was excited about that because I knew how good Steelix was and I was excited to try and get a high IV Onyx or Steelix for Ultra League or just a better one for Great League. The fact that so many Pokemon can be viable means that you tend to get excited about more things. Like if there's a recycled shiny in a community day, I don't care because it's getting a new move. I've always thought that PvP allows you to get more out of the game than just the shiny hunt would. That makes sense because the shiny hunt, of course, it's odds depending on how many you find. But once you get the shiny, you don't really have much to go after once it comes back. Right. And I think Niantic do a good job with releasing shinies into the game at the right rate so that people, like the hardcore grinders, still have some carrot to go for. The casual players, of course, are never going to complete the whole thing. 
I think PvP just naturally has a bit more of a dynamic ecosystem to it where there's always something fresh. Did you start PvP right when it first came out or was there a little bit of a buffer after it debuted? Yeah, immediately. This was even before Go Battle League was a thing. So originally, one year before Go Battle League came out, there was the Silf Arena. The Silf Arena is a fan-run, community-run organization. They're basically like the Pokemon Go version of Smogon. They had been around since like the start of Pokemon Go. They were originally the Silf Road, and the Silf Arena was just like an offshoot of that, which was focused just on PvP. I was actually at a Poke game, and uh, a friend of mine who also played the game said, oh, you go into this PvP tournament in Morton Lakes. And I'm like, what PvP tournament? And he shows me this poster that the guy running it had knocked up. And I decided to give it a go and absolutely loved it and played in every cup since then. And so I was doing that since the beginning. Then, of course, a year later, Go Battle League comes out. A few months after that, COVID happens and everything changes. Real quick, how good were you on your first tournament for Zilf? Like, were you pretty decent or were you kind of look back and it's cringeworthy? I was decent compared to people because like we were all learning this at the same time, right? So none of us knew anything. The whole idea of Great League and Ultra League, you generally want Pokemon with a low attack IV and high defense and stamina. Nobody knew that back then. With a few exceptions, but usually yes. Exactly, yeah. So nobody knew that back then. So after a few months, someone makes this discovery and we're all looking at our storage going, oh no, what have we done? <laughs> like deleting all these <laughs> <laughs> Pokemon, right? But yeah, in that first year, we were all discovering these things together. Things like discovering how good Vigoroth and Metacham, the idea of farming, like that's something that we didn't know how to do at the beginning. <laughs> and we collectively discovered that as a group. Was I good at that first tournament? So I got two wins and one loss. So I was reasonable. But compared to what even a casual battler could do now, I couldn't even compete. <laughs> it's got to be fun to see how PvP has grown over the years. From Silk Pro to when you were discovering everything. Since you've grown with PvP from here to now, what's been the biggest surprise to you for PvP overall? I think the biggest surprise to me has been seeing the drive and passion people can have for this game. I remember one of the first Continental Championships for the Silk Arena. They had a room packed out with hundreds of people. It went on so long that the venue had to kick them all out because of licensing <laughs> issues. And so the final battles were filmed on people's like phones and shared to the internet. So that's how underground it was, right? But I also remember hearing there was some kind of development manager for Pokemon Go in attendance there. And they saw in that moment the passion that these hundreds of people had for this game. And that's what gave them this idea to create a competitive system with their with PvP to make it more than just an extra fun little thing that you could do on the side with your friends. It's unfortunate that the pandemic did happen because I think it did kind of slow and affect how PvP grew. And now we're finally, you know, with the recent additions of the regional tournaments, you're mm -hmm. seeing more of the people come out, people who maybe never gone to in-person events and it's kind of fun to see just how the potential pvp really does have for the community totally i would actually push back a little on the effects of COVID on pvp because it made sylph have to like adapt and struggle but go battle league that was also the time that niantic adapted to that by removing the walking requirements that were originally in place for go battle league and so suddenly you've got the birth of pokemon pvp streamers it made it so much easier to make content around this stuff that wasn't just the underground sylph stuff. You could actually make official Pokemon Go PvP content. And so that caused, I believe, a huge boom in the numbers of people actually participating in the PvP feature of the Pokemon game. Sylph Arena, I don't know exactly how much it affected them, but of course, you know, it killed in-person tournaments. They're really fighting to bring that back at the moment. And I do have high hopes for them looking forward. But yeah, I think COVID did do some good things for the PvP scene. So do you think that if we still had that requirement, that PvP wouldn't be as big as it is now? I wholeheartedly believe that, yeah. So few people would be getting all their battles done. We, we wouldn't have the content machine behind it. 
I will also say, though, that the problems that Niantic have had, like, mechanically with their coding and stuff, that has also done a lot of damage to the overall ecosystem. A lot of people, a lot of people have lost patience and lost interest in the game. And again, it is something that, like, a lot of people weren't making a living off of, so, like, they saw no reason to keep on going with this thing that was just causing them frustration. Well, now that you say that, what's your biggest concern with PvP moving forward? The biggest concern I have is actually the attitude around it, because it seems to be accepted that if anything goes wrong, it's because Niantic are shit. (laughs) Um, Like, if you stub your toe, it's Niantic's fault. Like... (laughs) Um, And of course, like, the natural thing to blame them for everything that's going wrong. Whether it is a valid concern or not, I obviously don't want to discount the actual valid concerns. Like, there are things that they do wrong, but I think there's also a lot of things that they do right that doesn't get enough recognition. And also, a lot of the things that we say that they're doing wrong can come from not knowing the full story. They'll be doing things, they'll have reasons for doing things, and we don't know what those reasons are. So eventually you became part of the PvP corner at GoCast. Yes. How did that all happen? I was a patron of the GoCast community. I had been listening to the podcast. I really like Chris and Kyle's aesthetic as a team. I loved their positivity about the game. Even when they were complaining about stuff, which they do call things out when they disagree with something or think there's something that needs to be called out. But no matter if what they're saying is a positive or negative thing, it's always, you can hear it in their voices that it's always with an overtone or an undertone of, we do like this game. It's with good intention, says like. Yeah, it's with good intention. Yeah, that's a great way of putting it. So that really spoke to me. I've, I've always been drawn to positivity. I used to listen to a, a podcast where they broke down every episode of The Simpsons. And after they got past like season 12, I just became so fed up with them complaining about how bad the show was getting that I was like, nah, I'm done. With this and then stop listening <laughs> and it's why i might or might not listen to a lot of podcasts or consume a lot of content is i like to share it with people who are also having fun with this thing that i like i don't want to hear about why this thing that i like is so shit so i was part of their community they used to do weekly live streams themselves Every Thursday night, they would do a playthrough of a main series Pokemon game. And D5 would also hang out in those streams as well. One of these streams, we were talking about the latest episode, and I brought up the idea of, like, I I literally was in their Twitch chat and said, D5 and I should do, like, a regular PvP segment on the podcast. And Chris was like, yeah, you absolutely should. And, like, I was kind of joking. It was the kind of joke where it's like, if you think I'm joking, yeah, I was absolutely joking. If you think I'm serious, then yeah, oh, yeah, I meant that. <laughs> <laughs> You're just testing out the waters. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, <laughs> I'm just putting it out there in the universe. And he just immediately took to the idea. And I was so taken aback, thrown away, uh, blown away is <laughs> the word I was looking for. So, so blown away by how readily he was able to hand us the keys to the studio. Because I know if I were doing something like that, I'd be very, very protective of the product. It's something that I'd built. Like they've built an amazing community, an amazing product. And I would be very apprehensive of just letting someone else that I hadn't ever met in person to be such a huge part of that. Obviously, we'd been in that community enough that they had gotten a good sense of who we were, so they were all on board with the idea. I had to check with Chris a couple of times during the process of planning to be like, and you're sure you're okay with this? And it was like, yeah, man, absolutely. And then, yeah, we did our first segment. It was well-received, and away we went. It sounds like you chose DeFi to be kind of your co-host. Why'd you choose her? I don't even think... To say that I chose her implies like a kind of intentionality behind it. I think it just happened. So like I said, yeah, DeFi and I should do this. It was more because, you know, she was chatting there at the time. We were both talking about PvP. We'd both been communicating with each other about content. Like we were friends already and it just seemed so natural. So y'all go to y'all's first episode. It was actually in October of 2020. Was it awkward for y'all to kind of figure out how to work together or did it kind of flow together? I don't think it was awkward, but the process has definitely evolved. So, for example, and Chris and Kyle used to laugh hysterically about this. We used to do an entire run through of the segment before hitting the record button. So, yeah, we'd basically do everything twice. 
we'd start again, like we'd run through the whole segment and then make any kind of changes that we needed. And then we'd hit the record button and just do everything again. It was good for like avoiding all the stuttering and the ums and all that. But it also meant that any time we made each other laugh in the rehearsal, that moment was kind of lost if we tried to recreate it. So eventually we made that decision to just do the one run through and then just fix any problems in editing. Did you ever consider like branching off and becoming your own podcast at any point? No, no. There's a few reasons for that. One is that we both wouldn't have the time to promote that kind of thing ourselves. And secondly, like we enjoy being part of this thing that's already successful. Like that, it sounds selfish to say it, like they're already doing all the work of of, uh, promoting the show, but that is a part of it. Like to put in the work of starting from scratch, so to speak, and yeah, making it just our own thing. I don't think either of us are particularly interested in that. So last question about between y'all two. So if you and DeFi faced off in a show six pick three, best of three, who wins between you two? That has happened a few times. I believe I've won more than she has, but just barely. Okay. Just for casually or just out of just tournaments y'all participate together? In tournaments, mainly in tournaments we've participated in. I think we might have faced each other in factions one time or something like that. I know I played against her factions team. Might not have been against her specifically, but yeah, we have come across each other in like tournament play a couple of times. Do y'all like trash talk or anything like that before the matchup happens by chance? Like, or do y'all just treat it as business as usual? We're both super supportive, but also super competitive at the same time. So we're like, we're very polite to each other, but then whichever one of us loses, you can hear it in the other one's voice, how shitty they are about it. (laughs) (laughs) Oh, I bet. You've got to tiptoe around the other person for a, for a day or so. It's like, yeah, let them uh, clean their wound a little bit. Yeah, yeah, totally. Was the PvP corner your first dip into content creation, or did you used to do stuff before that? No, actually, before Go Battle League was a thing, I started with YouTube content. Mm-hmm. I used to do a thing that I still do occasionally do, and I think this is great content. I'm sad I don't still do it like on the reg. It was basically a battle breakdown where I would take just one battle, This was something that I don't think anyone was doing at the time, and I still think they don't do it. Most content these days will be featuring a team and just running through a whole bunch of battles at two times speed, showing this is how this did in this situation, this is how this did in this situation. What I would do is I would take just a single battle, and I would run through it for a bit, and then anything I thought was interesting, I would pause the video and then talk about, this is what's happening, these are the fundamentals that are at play here, this is what I have to think about, this is my win condition, this is what we are learning from this moment. So it would mean one battle could take like 20, 25 minutes to break down. But I got a lot of good feedback about how educational it was. Is it just because of time you can't go back to it? Does that mean the reason? Because you seem like a busy dude, I'll be honest. Uh, Yeah. (laughs) There's two possible answers to this. Like it never got a lot of views for a start. And that's something I've always really struggled with as a creator is I don't want to put all this effort into something that's going to get seen by 12 people. The reason I hesitate so much is because I also didn't know as much as a content creator about how to get my stuff seen. So I didn't know about the importance of a good thumbnail or a good title. I didn't know about how to get stuff shared by people. I didn't know the value of a call to action. You know, hit the subscribe button, hit the like button, (laughs) that kind of thing. Especially for this show, please do. Yeah, subscribe. (laughs) Trainer's eyes. Yeah, so maybe if I tried to take it back up again, maybe it would catch on again, but it could also just be that the audience that is already very, very small is accustomed to a certain type of content and they aren't looking to explore to other avenues. And it takes a lot of time to be able to edit the video and do all that other stuff, so... I've done away with that. I just do everything in one take. (laughs) Like literally, so I've got these um like five minute breakdowns of all the upcoming GBL metas that I do every week. I will do all of them in one take. And sometimes it can take me, I think one time it took me like 55 takes to get it all right. Yeah, I'll be a bit too perfectionist about it because like I'll mess up one Pokemon's name and I'll be like, well, got to start again. <laughs> <laughs> what is it about content creation that got you into it? It's a good question. I have always, this was actually a realization I came to pretty recently where I've always wanted to be a storyteller of some kind. So when I was in grade school, I was telling people I wanted to be an actor. 
post-schooling years, I would go through phases of doing like stand-up comedy, doing like blogging. I did have a podcast which lasted a few episodes, which I think had a lot of potential, but circumstances stopped that from happening. But yeah, I've always really enjoyed being in that world. And it was only recently that I realized the connective tissue between all of those things, which was the storytelling aspect of it. I gotcha. And now you get to share the story through Pallet Town PvP and through PvP in general. Yeah. In this modern age of where content is king, everyone wants to be a content creator. I, I don't know if you have heard this stat that like for the first time ever, content creator has become the most desired job among American school kids. So it used to be like astronaut or something like that, but now it's, yeah, now it's content creator. But in this day and age, everyone needs a niche. Vlogging isn't really a thing as much these days as it used to be, just like documenting your life. So anyone, if you're thinking about becoming a content creator in some capacity, it's most helpful to pick a specific thing that you are knowledgeable about, that you're passionate about. Passion is probably the most important one and focus on that thing. It is because if you try to be too broad, you don't attract anybody. You got to really be specific on this type of stuff you want to make. And like you said, have be genuinely interested throughout the entire process. Because if you don't like it, it's going to show. Yeah, totally. And to bring it to Pokemon Go PvP, there's like six people that play. So like it's a small niche. (laughs) Y'all aren't that small. Come on. (laughs) Yeah. yeah, yeah. is that small. Y'all aren't that small. Y'all have at least 12. (laughs) (laughs) like the the measuring stick like the biggest content creator in the pokemon go in the or the english speaking pokemon go pvp space is zionic and he gets like thirty thousand hits on the average that's good like i'd love to get seen by thirty thousand people but if you want to make a career out of that kind of thing like it's gonna be pretty difficult especially when you think about the youtubers you think of trainer tips mystic seven they need that within the first minute or two <laughs> yeah literally like they could upload a video of them sneezing and it would get 30 hits thirty thousand hits <laughs> moving on so eventually you decide to create pallet town pvp how about you tell us like what is pallet town pvp about Pallet Town PvP is a community that, in my eyes, is as free from the toxicity that can surround the game as possible. We focus on three things, and that is education, entertainment, and growth around Pokemon Go PvP, and kind of everything we do is in service of one of those three goals. And why those three words or pillars to describe your community or to have your community be built upon? I don't know. I guess I just held those truths to be self-evident, if that makes sense. Like, I thought that those... Okay, Abraham Lincoln. (laughs) I hope I'm using that phrase right. It's like, you you know, when a a kid's asking, like, why, why, why? It's every question. You try and get more and more granular. I don't think I can get more granular than that. So somebody new joins your Discord or joins your community. What's your ideal experience that you want them to have when they join Palette Town PvP? In a perfect world, would love for members to be able to give as much as they take from the server. I want people to come in and learn and grow, get, you know, increase their GBL rating, get better itself, etc, etc. But then I also would like them to be able to drop in and give their advice on someone's team or, you know, contribute to the server in some other way. It's like a monastery where people are staying with the monks and learning their ways, but they've also got to, you know, pitch in and work, you know, you know sweep the kitchens, <laughs> that kind of thing. That's kind of the ideal experience. Now, of course, like no judgment if people just want to lurk and read what's going on in the channels and that's it. We are absolutely fine with that. When I started Pallet Town PvP, the idea I had in mind was for it to be this thing where it's not my community, it's everyone's community. In fact, I actually sometimes get a little bit annoyed when people refer to it as my community because like, I'm trying so hard for it to not be my thing. I want people to have ownership of it. One of our members made an infographic for Silph's Ember Cup and it was actually picked up by the Silph Arena website, which, yeah, fantastic moment. And when I found out, I was like, oh, fuck, that's amazing. But then I saw that they'd attributed it to Fish on a Heater. And that actually genuinely annoyed me because I had very little to do with it. It was all, I'm going to give a shout out to LilyBear26. She makes most of our infographics and then has to deal with us going, oh, I think we should put that there, put that there, put that there. Um <laughs> But like it's it's all her way and like i'm trying to get in touch with the arena to correct that because yeah i don't want it to be about me 
No, that makes sense. You want it to be about everybody else. And it sounds like it's built about your idea of how you said going back to being positive. You want people to come in, be positive, learn. And then that's how we kind of learn from each other. Iron sharpens iron or pick up on another and stuff like that. Yeah, I'm so passionate about self-empowerment. And Mm -hmm. like that, that can take forms within the PvP space. It also takes many forms outside of the PvP space as well. But yeah, like helping someone to feel self-empowered is such a big deal to me. Well, that's very insightful, Fish. Thank you for coming on the show. I do have one last question before you take off. So with everything you've done with Palatown PvP, with the PvP corner for GoCast, for you doing stuff on Twitch and everything else you're involved with, what do you consider your biggest accomplishment when it comes to Pokemon Go? There was something that I was thinking about a while back that I remember specifically saying, I think this is my proudest achievement in Pokemon Go. And for the life of me, I can't remember what that was. You know, there's been some amazing accomplishments Pallet Town PvP was asked to host one of the qualifying streams of the Silph World Championships. That was a big, big deal. Every time I hit Legend in GBL, because I don't want to leave GBL out. I guess it's a, a whole story we haven't even covered yet, but I like when GBL was first a thing and everyone was paying attention to that, I had like a whole process of being very like bitter and jaded wanted people to see that sylph was the real pvp and go battle league was just this like way stripped down kind of pvp light but oh um, my God. yeah uh, why were you bitter i'm curious okay so <laughs> um in those pre go battle league days i refer to myself as a jehovah's witness of sylph <laughs> so it was like i was knocking on every door going have you heard about sylph um, <laughs> as you accepted drones as your savior <laughs> yeah that's right um, and so i spent so much time and effort trying to grow the in-person tournament scene in my city and then go battle league came around and it like i said it stripped back a, a lot of those things that i thought made self so good it was one battle instead of three which meant you didn't have a chance to adjust your opponent strategies the fact that it was blind battles rather than pick six and being able to see your team beforehand the elo system rather than the ranking system that sylph had you know there were a lot of things that i just thought was so much worse than sylph and yet because it was the official in-game thing everyone was paying attention to go battle league there were people in my area that i heard talking about like oh have you tried go battle league it's really cool and i'm I'm over here like oh i've been trying to get through to you people for so long And so that caused a lot of bitterness and it's a time where I was susceptible to toxicity of my own and it's taken me a very long time to grow enough to accept Go Battle League as being just as much, you know, just as important as, to be honest, more important (laughs) than still in the ecosystem and the health of PvP as a community. Was that like something that you just had to gradually learn or was it like a significant moment that kind of helped you change your mind? It was just a gradual thing. There wasn't one specific, probably just a whole bunch of like hundreds of little moments. Awesome, man. Well, thank you, Fish, for coming on the show. If people want to connect with you or check out your content, where can they go? Please, by all means, plug away. So it's just Pallet Town PvP on everything. So YouTube, Twitter, Twitch. We're on TikTok as well. We do have a Facebook page, but like GoCast, it's a ghost town with just tumbleweeds going through it. You can like that page if you want, and if enough people do that, then maybe we'll start putting some attention into that again. But yeah, Pallet Town PvP. And oh, and GoCast. I always forget to plug GoCast. GoCast podcast. And I'll make sure to include links to everything he said in the description of today's episode. Thank you for listening to another episode of As the Pokeball Turns. You can subscribe to this podcast on Apple, Spotify, or your favorite podcast app. If you want to support the show, consider becoming a Patreon by going to patreon.com slash as the Pokeball turns or by sharing the podcast with your friends and family. And I'll see you next time. Here's a sneak peek for the next episode of As the Pokeball Turns. That's so cool. I know, right? (laughs)